good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to our BINOS virtual meetup. I'm here this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are in the world, with Andrew Carr, Head of Consultancy at Bristol in the UK, and Tim Johnson, a Delivery Manager at Scott Logic, who are a FINOS member. Now, I'm really pleased to introduce um, the Scott Logic team with their webinar that they're producing this afternoon, which is called Faking It, How to Easily Create Realistic Test Data um, from our Data Helix project that we have within uh, the FINOS Foundation. Um, and this afternoon, before I actually pass the mic over to uh, Tim and Andrew, I'd like to just let everybody know that we will be um, giving away um, a couple of free FINOS t-shirts picked at random from people who have actually subscribed to this um, to this webinar. And so if you haven't subscribed, please head over to the FINOS um, LinkedIn page um, where you'll find details of this event, which have been posted today. Um, if you hit the register, there'll be a form, put your name in there, and then you'll be entered for um, the uh, free FINOS t-shirts that will be picked at random during this event. Also, whilst you're on LinkedIn and looking at the FINOS um, page, please do subscribe for further updates. Um, as you know, we do have all of our various different projects that we run and different events that we organize. And you can also like us on Twitter. And also, if you go over to finos.org, you'll find our Get Involved page, which will give you um, an idea about how you can get involved in our projects and all of our activities and also where you can subscribe for newsletters. Now, if you are a developer, um, please head over to github.com forward slash Finos um, to start contributing into the Finos organization. Um, and also, if you have any questions relating to either Finos or the presentation this afternoon by Andrew and Tim, please do drop them into the chat um, where I will uh, pass those across to the team in the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And so with that, I'd like to say hi to Tim. And hi, Tim, would you please guide us through your presentation this afternoon? Sure. So uh, in fact, Andrew, do you want to introduce yourself first and then uh, I'll go? Yeah, so uh, Tim's gonna do most of the webinar, but I'll give some, I guess, context uh, because I was uh, the person to kick the project off originally. But yeah, so myself, I'm Andrew Carr. I'm head of consultancy for our Bristol office at Scott Logic. Uh, and as uh, James said, Scott Logic are a FinOS member uh, and we're, um, I guess, uh, big supporters of open source software in general. Um, so I've been at Scott Logic now, I think it's coming up for four years actually. Uh, and my background, I guess, is uh, I've been in financial services for a while. So I used to work at Goldman Sachs and Citigroup before then. Uh, but prior to then, uh, I used to work in the telecoms industry. Uh, and I guess um, to give you some background, um, well, actually, let me introduce Tim first. So Tim's actually one of our new delivery managers. Do you want to say a little bit about yourself, Tim? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty new to, to Scott Logic. Uh, in fact, I, I joined on the, the 16th of March, which is a, a date that will stick me, with me forever because, uh, of course, that's when the lockdown started. Uh, managed a single day in the office uh, to quickly get around and see people um, before starting this uh, new regime of working remotely. And one thing that did start up, there was a, there was a particular piece of um, uh, government client work that started up as a result of the, um, the COVID crisis. And Andrew asked me to to help out with that and to help them to generate um, realistic test data um, using Data Helix. Um, and with no background as to you know Scott Logic and and Data Helix itself, I have actually been able to use the tool. So sort of hence this this talk really to show that if if I can use it as a delivery manager, uh, then then you know it's, it's it is an easy thing to use. So I will take you through the details of that. But um, before we go into those details, then Andrew, you're going to talk about the background, aren't you? Yes, that's right. So yeah, as I explained, Data Helix was an idea uh, that I, I came up with. Basically, the, the idea kind of was stewing with me uh, when I used to work at Goldman Sachs. And I guess since uh, joining Scott Logic, I've, I've seen this problem not only at, at GS, but a number of our clients 
where you know uh, the software development has tended to go well. Uh, the developers want to test some data in their dev environments or maybe a UAT environment, and and you know the challenge of uh, and actually if you go to the next slide, Tim, the challenge of how do you uh, use good test data? How do you have reasonably realistic test data to to develop your application? And I guess it's a challenge for a number of reasons. One, because it's actually harder and harder to take data from production and just place it into UAT and test. Um, certainly with uh, all the regulations that have come in, it's, it's now um, harder to get access to production data. Um, there's also the challenge that sometimes when you're developing an application, um, the data that you need won't have been generated yet in production. Maybe you're introducing a new financial product uh, or something like that. Um, and I guess there's uh, a whole uh, challenge of actually, if you do take data from production and you start using it in test environments, uh, sometimes that data will need to be data aged. So, for example, if you're taking a, a day's worth of trading data and actually you're then needing to use it uh, a few days later, that data will, will, won't be correct because all the dates in it will be older and it's not maybe as simple as just adding three to the dates. So actually, you know, making the data accurate for now uh, can be a challenge. And then there's always the problem that actually, you know, we've, we've certainly seen uh, since COVID-19 and, you know, when the markets go up or down. And, and certainly I know when there was lots of sales, uh, we've been chatting to quite a few of our clients who have experienced much higher than normal volumes. So <clears throat> one of the comments I heard was uh, a normal day during the kind of March uh, COVID-19 uh, sell-off was four times as much as it was historically. So how do you test data volumes that you've never seen before? Uh, and, and simply taking a day's worth of production data, for example, won't be the data volumes you're looking for. So I guess for all those reasons, uh, and certainly I know it was a problem for me when I was at Goldman Sachs, uh, I wanted a way to, to generate data synthetically. Uh, and so, uh, Tim, if you go to the next slide. Really, it kind of happens uh, one night after a long day. Uh, I was uh, in London and I'd been to see several clients who'd all talked about the, the challenges they'd had with test data. And I was actually chatting to two of our senior testers in a restaurant and just wondering you know, whether we could build a, a command line tool to generate some synthetic data and have it as a rules-based tool. Uh, to uh, allow us to, to generate some synthetic data really quickly, but have some complex rules so that it can actually generate some quite rich data uh, and whether we could build that and, and open source it. And I guess uh, the data helix just really kind of kicked off from there. Uh, and so um, after I, I set a few developers uh, to kick it off and build a little tool, and we ended up building something that generated some data that looked um, quite realistic to me, uh, we decided to uh, actually go ahead and see whether any of our clients uh, would be interested in using that. And Tim, could you hit the next slide, please? So actually, uh, for one of our clients, um, they were uh, uh, a company that provides a service that does uh, that sends uh, trades to some uh, trade reporting repositories. Uh, and one of the services they provide is they take huge amounts of trades in from their clients and they actually uh, um, do some sanity tests on the trades. They enrich some of the trades. And actually, then what they do is uh, send those trades off uh, to be reported. And obviously, uh, in their test environments, they have that exact challenge that um, they didn't want the developers to see all the production data, but they wanted their developers to be able to uh, test with reasonably realistic data. And for that, we uh, used the data generator uh, to generate about 180 million rows of some futures and options data for them. Uh, and that actually worked out really well in production because uh, no one needed to check that data because it was synthetic. It didn't have any of the challenges uh, that you would typically get from taking production data uh, and using that. And if I hand over to you, Tim. Okay, so this is the, the, uh, the, the project that I was helping with. This is a government client, it's still live work. Um, and the situation they have is that they've got um, a, a legacy um, system based on SQL Server. 
that's um, having to generate reports of, of 26 million records each day and uh, disseminate that that data and the the, the system's creaking at the seams and and needs Im improving before it falls over completely and they also want to extend it uh, there is a system that they've developed based on apache spark as a replacement but um, currently that's that's unproven and People are not willing to take the risk to move this critical function onto this new um, system. So to kind of de-risk that, to make people more comfortable, what's happening at the moment is the, the data that's in the current system is being kind of faked for the new system to show that it can handle it, um, both functionally and at load. Uh, with the previous example that Andrew was talking about, it was it was mostly about the performance at, at this point with this customer it's it's about the sort of functional comparison so it's trying to get that true um, true test data that's going to really exercise it and yeah but despite not having used data helix before i've i've been able to help a bit um uh, this this project to, to help improve the quality of that that test data so what i'd like to do now is is kind of walk through kind of of how I've how I've done it. Um, I've not used their example. I've, I've gone for a fictitious um, example, um, quite a simple example, and I've just picked some some fields that kind of demonstrate the different aspects of Data Helix and the different um, different functions it's got. I've gone with a um, sensitive personal data kind of bent to it, uh, with yeah, forename, surname, date of birth. I've put in a um, fictitious um, Boolean field here of is adult to show relationships. Um, we've got password, postcode, and country. So those are the things I want to generate the data for. So if you basically go to the the Finos GitHub um, uh, site, there's a the Data Helix project, and when you follow that, the first thing you get to is this uh, microsite of links. You notice in the in the background down the bottom, we've actually got some um, some some data that's been faked. And when you go to this uh, live, that is that's sort of streaming based on an instance of Data Helix that's kind of running in the background just to kind of show it off. Um, and the links we've got there, we've got a basic getting started guide um, with the, the simplest things you need to do to to get started. Um, there's a user guide. Once you're comfortable with it, that will tell you about all the possibilities there are, all the different um, different types and options. Um, but what was really great for me, um, <laughs> I was a bit rusty and done any um, anything approaching development for for a while. Is there's a, an online online playground which allows you to um, to play around with Data Helix and get to know it uh, without having to install anything. So if we show you what that playground looks like. I'm not expecting you to, um, to read all this at the moment. We're going to pick this apart um, step by step, but to give you an overall feel of what the playground is like, on the left-hand side is where we specify the, the, the data formats and, and constraints, things we, we want to create. And when we run it, the generated data appears on the right hand side. So we can see at the top here, um, we've got those those fields that we talked about earlier. Up here at the top right, we've got an examples uh, set. So when you're online, um, click on that and there's a, there's a bunch of examples that come up there. And that's, that's again, really useful for getting started. So let's pick that apart. So the simplest thing we can do is a single field, um, which I've picked on password here, um, a string field with no constraints at all. And when we run that, we get um, this large string. This is the default uh, string. And yes, that's that's rather large. So we want to be able to constrain that down and make that a bit more realistic by adding constraints. This is in um, in JSON. If, if we I certainly wasn't familiar with JSON beforehand, 
So it's a standard um, industry format. So to add a constraint, it's adding more fields to the uh, JSON at the bottom. Here we've got a uh, regular expression. This is, uh, again, if, if people haven't seen this before, this is standard tight notation on how to do matching of that string. Um, here I've got a, a simple example of it's a lowercase alpha character between six and 10 characters long. And that gives us a more of a, um, a constrained, uh, more realistic password. But then of course you can um, play with these regexes and have them um, as accurate and as representative as you need them. Depends on how, how, how detailed you want to go. So we've now got a string with that constraint. The next thing is a date field. So is the different um, type of field. Here we've got um, a couple of constraints to restrain the date of birth to be um, something realistic. Without these, it could be thousands of years into the future. Um, so we're, we're trying to get those realistic in that way. So we've got that data with two constraints. Now, what I'm showing here is when it starts to get interesting is that you've got a, I've got an example of it is adult Boolean field, true or false. And we've got a relationship between two fields now. So towards the bottom, um, I've put in a, if date of birth is after a particular date, um, then they are, they are a child, so it's false, otherwise true. So this is where we can start to build up some is as complicated logic as you need for your testing um, by yeah having one field racing to another and we can also see here to start to simulate bad quality data here we've got data of birth as being um, it's, it's allowed to be null so we've got gaps in that data test those circumstances Next, what we've had so far is strings that are within their constraints. They can be anything um, randomly within those constraints. But it's Data Helix, within Data Helix itself, there's, there's fake data. So we've got different types of um, fake data. Here I'm showing first name and last name. So it's got sets of first names and last, last names built into it and it will then pick from that, that list. There's, there's a, a reasonable range here. This is all stuff that we've added. Um, we had sort of finance industry in mind when we developed this. So there's things like um, valid ISIN codes, um, RIC codes, QSIP codes. Um, there's a number of things in there, but the, the user guide will then uh, tell you what's available and, and how to use it. So by using that, that fake data, um, we've, we've, we've improved the data um, further. So this is getting more and more realistic. But it's not just the fake data within Data Helix itself. We've also added support for uh, the Java Faker library, which I believe is built on Ruby Faker originally. And there is, yeah, is that the whole list there. Here I've picked out um, country, so it picks from this um, faker list of countries. Um, but there, there are masses of, of different things to pick from with faker. Um, there are more currency thing, more financial things like currency and stock codes. If comms data is your thing, then um, there is uh, internet fields like IP addresses and user agent strings. If you're interested in modeling some of the, the specifics there, and some. Um, uh, yeah, very specialist things. It's a big, big list to pick from. So that allows us to yeah, expand the fake data further. Um, so we've we've got as far as this now. We've we've um, we've shown that we've got um, password constrained. We've got some fake data for the countries and um, poor names and surnames, uh, and we've got this the relationships between different fields. Um, for postcode, I've put in a regular expression that um, 
constrains it to be uppercase for I can't remember that seven or eight characters. But if it's important, then we can improve upon that by having an external lookup. Now, this is something that the playground itself doesn't support. This is where you start you need to start using the command line. But it's 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 very simple. Um, data helix with it with a number of um, options all, all described in the documentation and in this example I've got a snippet of, uh, of, of profile here where the constraint is that the postcode is within a set in a CSV file so we've got a CSV file here of, of real postcodes and it's it's picking from those um, you can see here I've done a, um, I'm showing this in the Google Sheet, and we can see that the postcodes are now um, realistic um, values. So this, this kind of demonstrates that if you've got any particular sort of reference data, standing data that um, you're interested in um, and is, is available to use, then that can help to make the test data even more rich. The command line gives other um, options as well, uh, things like rather than having uh, the data completely random, you can have um, the data done in sequence. So it would start at the lowest possible value within its constraints and then step up one by one until it exercises the entire set. Um, so that's, there's no alternative. Um, now, you might see that we're in this particular example, We've got um, like UK postcodes, but then the countries are not UK. Um, and this is because the fields are just, it, as, as it processes each field, it's just thinking about that field by itself and it's, it's, it's um, running according to the rules it's got for that um, field at that time. It's not, um, it's not going further than that. If that was interested, interesting to you to get more, more realistic, um, then you can have the relationships. We can put those ifs in and use other lookups. But that's, uh, I'm trying to keep it simple there. Okay, so something we've been thinking about for a while, it's been on a roadmap for a while, is support for relational data. Uh, at the moment, the data is, is, is flat. We define our fields, um, click on run or, or run up the command line, and it will go away and uh, generate as many rows as you like, but it is a, a single table. And what we'd like to be able to do, but it's quite hard, is add support for relational data. You can have multiple um, tables with links between them. Um, so what we've able to do as a as a step towards that is, is add support for children so I've got a a snippet here of of um, profile and here we've we're now adding a relationships um, part of this which says how this row then relates to um, some some uh, some ch uh, child rows basically and those child rows can have their own separate profiles so in this instance we've got just a very simple thing of we've got a, a child with a name and I'm um, constraining that to be relatively short and we, we run that again by, by the command line and we can see there that we've got um, Jamie with no dependents and uh, Jacob with with three and that's that's a, a step towards Relational, it's not um, not fully covering it yet, um, but that just gives another option um, for you to model uh, more complex data. So, Tim, uh, while you're talking about uh, the future, so I just want to bring up um, obviously, you know, relational data is something that's come up quite a lot in discussions we've had. Uh, also, uh, nested JSON and some, uh, I guess, similar types of requirements, but actually. Um, the, the interesting thing about this journey we've been on with uh, building the data, data generator is we've ended up having lots of conversations about synthetic data generation 
And in fact, we've ended up doing uh, quite a few projects with our clients about it. Um, and it's kind of brought us to see uh, one of the other great uh, data generator projects, which uh, I would like to give a shout out to, which is uh, the Data Hub, which I know Paul Groves has just submitted to Finos. And that's another excellent uh, project. Um, I think the whole area is actually quite complex when you look at it. And, um, you know, we're really interested in, in more, you know, kind of engagement or, or, I guess, feedback in where people would like us or are curious for us to take this. Uh, and so we're going to have uh, regular conversations with Paul Groves, uh, who's, who's submitted a data hub project, and really see if we can kind of bring our energies together in terms of being interested in synthetic data uh, and see where, you know, this, this whole thing within Thinos should go. But um, there's a number of areas it can and directions it can go in. I know uh, one of the projects we did, uh, they were interested in synthetic data generation where the rows have relationships. So uh, the data helix has quite complex relationships between the columns, but actually it can't do relationships between rows of data. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, a bank account um, where, you know, you're typically going to have uh, a certain amount of money going out every month and hopefully you don't spend more than you get in. Um, but, um, you know, a human who, who does transactions on her account, own account will be very aware of that. So, you know, having rules where the rows can have rules between them and certainly, you know, the validation rules on the data itself, what could be valid for the data can be as rich as the application. So. I guess that means that, generally speaking, uh, synthetic data generator generation can actually be a, quite a complex place. So because of there's all these different um, directions we could go in, uh, I think it's, it'd be really good uh, within Finos for, you know, the members and everyone to give feedback in, you know, where do they see uh, the next set of features or, or, or the best direction for, for these synthetic uh, generation tools to, to go in. So, yeah, definitely very keen on, on lots of feedback. So. If you do have any feedback or any interesting comments yourself or requirements, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So um, doing do. Yeah, I do encourage engagement with the project. So sorry, back over to you, Tim. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, no, um, that, that's it, basically. So, yeah, just to say that um, please can people give it a try. Uh, just yeah, the online playground is, is very easy to use um, just give it a spin and uh, and see if it would work for your use case. Right, so that that's amazing. Um, thank you very much, um, Andrew, for the shout outs to um, Data Hub. Um, that's that's brilliant, and you actually caught me um, putting the links to the various different um, issues on GitHub for both Data Helix and also for Data Hub. And so, if people do want to um, submit any feedback against either of the projects. You can find both Data Helix and Data Hub um, on the Finos organization on GitHub, where you'll be able to engage with the project teams um, through the GitHub issues. Um, that includes, you know, anything that you would like to um, request in terms of features or any other types of feedback, or even if you want to, you know, clone a repo and, you know, get it running locally. Um, <laughs> Okay, so before um, I actually go into the Q&A, um, we are able now to um, reveal he's actually won Finos t-shirts. Um, and so I'd like to say congratulations to, and I believe these are, this is how you pronounce names, so apologies if I get these wrong, um, but Kaya Fine of um, Equium and Vladimir Sakharov of JP Morgan Chase. Um, thank you very much for registering for the uh, webinar this afternoon, and that means that there will be a there will be one um, Finos T-shirt each coming to to both of you through the post. Um, and so, um, Andrew and Tim, I do have a couple of um, questions that um, that have been asked. Um, the first is, how do I get started with contributing to Data Helix? And the second is, is there a limit on how much data can be generated? So uh, there's no limit on how much data that can be generated. I guess it, it has two modes. You can either stream the data out in, in a kind of Unix I/O fashion, or you can you can uh, output the data to a flat file. And I guess either way, um, yeah, there's no natural limit uh, to how much data can be generated. Saying that, obviously, if you're not trying to generate in advance, you're trying to generate on the fly. 
there's a natural limit to how complex your rules are. So the more complex the rules are, the slower the data generation will be. Um, a potential future we've been discussing is actually to, to re-engineer it slightly and build it on the Apache Spark framework such that it can hugely scale out if the rules end up quite complicated. So that's something we've been kind of throwing around as a potential idea. Um, we haven't, if I'm honest, hit a use case where the uh, data volumes have been an issue yet, but saying that, you know, never say never. And uh, if someone comes up with an idea where they've got um, a data volumes which are too high and, and the tool can't cope, it's definitely something that, you know, we will consider looking at. Uh, so that was the uh, data volumes. What was the other question, James? Oh, how did you get started? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, to just follow the the, 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 the GitHub page um, and, yeah, raise some issues, um, start conversations, and, and start contributing back. Absolutely get engaged. So, so that's, that's brilliant. Thank you. And I did actually manage to drop the link to the Data Helix issues um, in the chat for anybody who wants to um, browse to the project and engage with um, both Andrew and Tim, who are part of the project. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you very much to both Andrew and Tim for joining us this afternoon um, on the um, Finos virtual meetup. And I'd like to thank everybody for registering and joining. Um, remember to subscribe to our updates on LinkedIn and also the Finos Twitter, um, where you'll be able to um, find out all future and up, up and coming uh, webinars that will be coming from Finos. So with that, thank you very much, Andrew and Tim, and thank you everybody for being here.